Hello, and thank you for joining us for this View from the Top session. I'm John Watkins, Managing Editor of Global Custodian, and I'm delighted to be joined by Lever Mostre, Chief Executive Officer of Euroclear Group. Lever, great to be talking with you today. Thank you, John. It is my pleasure as well. Well, let's dive right in, shall we? You've, you've been Euroclear CEO for almost five years now, and a, a sizable chunk of that time has, of course, been spent during the pandemic. So I wanted to start by looking back at the past 18 months for Euroclear. And obviously, like everyone, you've had to contend with the pandemic, the working from home environment, but also that huge spike in volumes and activity we saw in those early months. So I guess my question is, what have you learned during this period as an organization and what has changed about Euroclear now compared with back at the start of 2020? Thank you, John. Indeed, it has been an incredible period these past uh, 18 months. Uh, and we have learned a number of important things over that period. First of all, and I think this will not surprise you, first of all, we have learned that people are about the most important asset that we have as an organization to serve our clients. Secondly, uh, I would say very happily, we have learned that we can adapt quickly and that we have an agility uh, that is maybe even beyond what was expected uh, in the past. And then thirdly, we have also learned that uh, getting through situations like this, it is even more important that the social purpose of an organization is crystal clear and well articulated in order to get you through difficult situations. And maybe I want to dwell a bit on the three elements that I have just mentioned for you. So first of all, for the people. What we had very, very rapidly seen, and at the beginning of the crisis, we didn't know where we were going. Uh, but very rapidly, we had seen that a critical, critical asset would be that we would put the well-being and the safety of our people first. And it was one of my big first concerns that we might lose colleagues uh, becoming very ill or, or potentially even dying in this, in this very unknown situation. And, and, and people are critical for everything. So, so we wanted to put uh, that safety and that well-being on the first uh, page uh, in order to be able to continue to serve our clients. And we have made that very, very clear. And so we all went home. Uh, luckily, already before the pandemic, uh, and we had had, unfortunately, the experience of terrorist attacks in some of our main uh, cities, being Brussels and Paris. And so we had already experienced and prepared for contingent situations. And so everybody had indeed a laptop, everybody had headset, uh, everybody had the connectivity from home to the office. So when we all went home on the famous uh, Friday night, uh, mid-March, we all had our equipment and we all had uh, clear instructions there. Um, what we saw indeed was the possibility to adjust very, very quickly. And I'm particularly proud of our IT organization that had to put no limits whatsoever on people working. We could all immediately, simultaneously work from home. And as you say, on volumes that had spiked in tremendously uh, in that period because the markets were so volatile and so worried. And we were even in the possibility to open, especially for our clients, on Saturdays and Sundays because some of our clients struggled a bit more to cope with the volumes than we did. And so that gave them the opportunity to catch up uh, in those moments. So I'm particularly proud of how we were able to do that. Uh, we have, over that total period, continued to pay a lot of attention to communication with our staff, uh, even as we didn't know exactly where we were going, but we felt it was important that people remained connected, remained engaged with the company, felt supported. Uh, we have launched special initiatives around well-being from a distance, also in that period. 
we have launched we also saw and that's the third dimension i want to come to the social purpose um how very rapidly people when they were assured that euroclear was doing fine people got very concerned about society and we were in a position to rapidly support the environment around us staff was able to select uh, courses to support hospital, to support uh, proximity um, institutions in need of help in this special situation. And that helped us also to keep everybody engaged and motivated in those difficulties. Yeah, so a lot of challenges, some similar to others and some unique to yourself, but it sounds like you certainly had a strategy in place to overcome them. Uh, indeed, indeed, uh, it has been learning by doing, uh, but it has connected the organization well together. And we have seen that our clients have responded very positively on the way we were able to uh, continue to serve them in these very special moments. Well, thank you for that. And if I look at the topics of Cybos this year, and certainly in many past years, DLT comes up a lot. And within that, the idea of disintermediation and the question of whether we need incumbent infrastructures like CSDs. And of course, I'm quoting that, not my opinion, but I see you doing a lot of work around innovation in this space. So what I'm interested in is whether you see the technology as a threat to your business uh, or not, and, and how are you embracing it and working with it? Uh, it's a very, very interesting topic. I'm, I'm myself an engineer and a technician by background. So you can imagine that uh, I'm personally very interested, but also the organization is following very closely. And we just come out uh, very recently out of an interesting experiment uh, in the matter of TLT, uh, together with uh, market actors to really simulate uh, the issuance, but not only the issuance, also the allotment, the initial trading of, of, of um, bonds uh, on DLT ledger. And, and it is it is fascinating because I do believe that we see plenty of opportunity and everybody can see how a future, the ideal future could be reached uh, where the whole world is connected uh, to the same ledger and can, uh, without limitations of, of necessary energy, if, if that would still be relevant at that point in time, or without limitations, without need for reconciliation, be almost simultaneously all together settled and, and aware and transparent of all the information. Um, the difficulty is, in our view, much more, how do we get there? And, and it seems to be that there is a lot of chicken and egg in the file, in the sense that um, is it attractive for an issuer to go on a, a digital ledger if there are very few investors connected to it? And what will drive an investor to connect to a new environment? if there is very few issues on it. So I think the transition, I, I think we have all come to appreciate uh, the future potential. Uh, we see that the transition is still going to be a big challenge. And I believe it is exactly in facilitating and thinking this through and seeing how we will require for many, many years interoperability because between what I would say the old world and the new world. And we believe that uh, it is for incumbents like ourselves that embrace the new environment and the new possibilities that we can really be the facilitator and allow different market actors to evolve and to uh, migrate and to invest in their own pace and then take the benefits gradually as a total ecosystem. So that is how we look at that. We look at it as something where we could be amongst early adopters, but also I would say the linking pin and, and, and being pot potentially the ones that help solving the chicken and the egg problem. Thanks. A really interesting answer. And I guess given what you've just said, you're also going to have a great interest in central bank digital currencies. What are your thoughts on their role in the future of finance and what work are you doing around this concept? Well, very clearly, we do not imagine 
a world uh, in which securities uh, would be tokenized and, and, and be handled on, on a digital ledger and, and central bank money uh, not being. So, so the CBDC is clearly very much connected to our world and it is an area in which we are remaining very closely involved as well because it comes a bit together with the tokenization of securities and being able to handle them on a digital ledger. So the experiment I was referencing in, in the previous moment uh, also clearly includes uh, that central bank digital currency. And I would say beyond all our world, clearly uh, those currencies can facilitate uh, digital inclusion. And you could even see that in emerging markets where the financial world is less developed, they play even a bigger role in, in kind of a bit what we have seen uh, on the telephone side, uh, where some of those countries have switched landlines and uh, have more moved immediately to mobile phone, where you could very well see that a central bank in some of emerging markets can have such a level of trust that it can contribute to accelerating uh, financial inclusion and financial modernization of those markets. So again, it's an environment that I think it is very passionate um, for, for the entire world. It is close to our business and uh, we follow it with a lot of interest. Great, thanks. And we've certainly addressed some of the themes at Cybos this year, but one of the trends I'm seeing in security services here at Global Custodian is around innovation and how incumbent players like Euroclear approach it through a variety of ways. Therefore, I was wondering if you could touch upon your approach and, and whether it is built internally by or partner with the likes of, of fintechs. Thank you, John. Well, it is clearly the three, and I would say during the COVID-19 crisis, we have already seen a number of opportunities where we could, together with the ecosystem, accelerate a number of antiquated uh, processes and, and put very new things in place. If we look at our approaches, we do obviously quite a number of things internally. Uh, be that on the side of robotics, where we improve our own processes uh, and, and, and have uh, uh, quite some efficiency gains. Uh, we have been working quite a lot on a number of cloud services for our clients, uh, be it in, this, in the area of investor insight, be it in the area of Vantage in Sweden. And then we are also working on APIs, on renewing our portal with EasyWay. So all those are a number of internal uh, evolutions that we do. But we, it doesn't stop there. Uh, we have also a number of uh, acquisitions done. Uh, if I look at uh, the obvious one is Taskize, uh, you know that we have been working with the ecosystem to make sure that the non-STP flows can also be as structured and as organized as possible. And the Taskize product, which we have bought from a fintech uh, developer, uh, has really evolved over time in the ecosystem, is now used by hundreds of clients over more than 50 countries. And it has become truly a, a tool in the relationship between Euroclear and its clients. And then also I would say another example of where we have acquired skills, knowledge and tools is our very recent acquisition of MFEX, uh, where funds distribution services, which were not part of our offering so far, uh, now will be part of the Euroclear offering thanks to the acquisition of MFEX. And then in between, partnering with fintechs, learning from them, seeing what they can offer as products and seeing whether we can bring them together to clients is also an avenue that we use a lot towards innovation. And another topic that we're addressing a lot at Global Custodian is data. And of course, that, that mountains of, those mountains of data that security services organizations and financial market infrastructures do sit on. I'm interested, what is your strategy around data provision for clients and I guess monetizing this as well? Very clearly, uh, the data angle is kind of a new business line for ourselves that we uh, put a lot of investment in and that we are working very hard in. 
As you know, we sit on 36 trillion holding of securities and we operate transactions, uh, 280 million transactions over the year worth of 900 trillion of euro um, equivalent. So what is in there is truly a wealth of information uh, of which uh, clearly we can give more insights to the clients. And as of today, we have, I would say, three categories of products uh, that we share with clients and that are the start of our data business. First of all, everything that has to do with reference data, because, because of the number of securities that we process, because of the criticality of our processes, the trust that the market can put in our reference data is very, very high and can contribute to even securing the ecosystem even more. So that is a first bucket of very relevant data. The second relevant data is everything that has to do with settlement activity. And I would uh, say that with the upcoming uh, settlement discipline regime under CSDR, it becomes of even bigger importance and of bigger value for our clients that we help them and that we support them uh, with analysis of their settlement activity. And we even have artificial intelligence tools that help them predict uh, where they could see fails in their settlement activity and help them anticipate those fails and avoid uh, the penalties that could go with it. So that is secondly a very important bucket for the whole of the ecosystem. And then thirdly, clearly, there is also everything that has to do with ownership of securities. Again, with the 36 trillion and with the tools that we can give to our clients that give transparency on ownership, that will help our clients, the intermediaries, to fulfill their transparency requirements as new regulations has put upon them. So these are three examples where we believe we are already very relevant today and that see the potential of future new developments in the data business to support the environment and our clients. So I guess finally, to, to address another big, big topic, a few weeks ago, I saw you issued a paper with PwC on sustainable finance and specifically the, the cross-border financial market structure driven approach. I'm interested, what did you discover were the barriers to a sustainable market in the future and, and what actions do you think can be taken by infrastructures like Euroclear to make change? Thank you for that question. It's a very, very interesting topic and we are very dedicated to it. Uh, so indeed, we did that study with PwC to try to make sure that we have as good an insight as possible indeed to say what is hampering a um, much bigger scaling up of the sustainable finance market, uh, both from the issuer side and from the investor side. And if we look at it, there is quite a lot that still can be done. And, and very humbly, we believe that there are things in which we can contribute. Uh, firstly, it is for is issuers not easy uh, to be very clear on the type of transparency they have to give, on the use of proceeds of their issuance, on how they will have impact on the different dimensions of the ESG agenda how they can demonstrate that, and with that, how they can have the trust of the investors, that this will really be uh, the type of instrument in which the investor wants to put his money in order to support the ESG agenda. So first element is to support the issuers. Uh, we see that under the shape and the form of uh, standard frameworks. You can even see that under the form, and then we link back uh, to some of your previous questions on, on innovation, you can even see that under the form of smart contracts that facilitate the issuance of ESG products. Uh, so uh, there is a first big topic on supporting the issuers, giving them uh, easy access, standard frameworks, and I would say a very practical guide uh, through the complex world of issuing uh, sustainable products. That's the first level. Uh, the second dimension that we have identified is the fact that it is not only issuance, but it's the whole corporate life of an institution and of an issuance 
that remains relevant for an investor uh, so that the investor can continue to validate uh, the ESG characteristics of, of the products and the company in which uh, he is putting his money. And we compare that very much to uh, something that we know already, because as an infrastructure, we are already today linking issuers and investors through the corporate life uh, in corporate action data. And so we kind of see a parallel there. Uh, where we can be that linking pin between the issuer and the investor and have regular flows of information updating the investor on how the issuer remains compliant with commitments taken at the moment of issuance on a number of impact data with relation to uh, the ESG agenda. And then thirdly, what we also see is that today issuance and investment in sustainable finance is still very much focused on um, fixed income in developed world. If we, if we simplify it, that is still where the focus is. And we believe that there is more that can be done across different asset classes and we have those asset classes on our book, so we believe uh, very humbly that there we can contribute as well. And secondly, where it is even more important, and you know that a party that was close to our study was also the World Bank. And so for emerging markets, um, the challenge to issue sustainable finance and to have access to the investors is even much bigger. And so we believe that our experience in Euroclearability, where we have in the past uh, been able to connect emerging markets to uh, the international investor world, is also an experience on which we can capitalize to bring emerging markets closer to sustainable finance investors. So there we also see an opportunity for ourselves and combined uh, the study, and I will not uh, go into all the details here, but the study clearly demonstrates that there is truly a contribution that we can make that is very material uh, to bring um, 25 trillion more of possible investments in the sustainable finance world. We believe that is not nothing. The study translates on what that can mean uh, in reduction of carbon gases, if you want to translate it to that in education, etc., etc., and so uh, we see there a huge potential, and we are really very committed to contribute to making that happen. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, again, just lastly, I, I guess linking to what we discussed at the start, is there an opportunity for some of the innovation and concepts like DLT or tokenizations play a role in sustainable finance in the future? In your opinion? Uh, very clearly, I have already mentioned to you the possibility to, uh, to for us to host smart contracts uh, that then indicate the sustainability characteristics uh, of an issuance uh, towards the investor world. That is clearly one opportunity. Uh, you can also look at some of the impact data uh, that uh, a company uh, links to its issuance in order to make sure that it can demonstrate its sustainable character. Also there you could see tokenization as a tool to transmit those elements in the ecosystem. These are just first thoughts. Uh, we are working on them together with the ecosystem. And as I said, as there is a bit the chicken and egg uh, question versus DLT, uh, maybe these are a bit longer term and maybe we can already contribute to the sustainable agenda a bit faster on in all technology, but we look at both avenues in parallel. Excellent. Well, between ESG, data, DLT, I think we talked about almost everything today. Uh, Lever, it's been wonderful to talk to you and fascinating to hear about your clear strategy and plan. So thank you once again for your time and answers today. Thank you, John. It was my pleasure.